Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Playing It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Z with another episode of the Playing It Safe podcast. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and following my work. I am super passionate about acceptance and commitment skills applied to anxiety, stress, and any type of fear-based struggles like perfectionism, procrastination, fears of public speaking, phobias, and any other issue you're having driven by anxiety, stress, and fear. Um, for those of you that are listening to the podcast for the first time, I want to invite you to subscribe to the newsletter, Playing It Safe. You can go to the website www.thisisdrz.com. Again, the website is www.thisisdrz.com. When you subscribe to the newsletter, you can expect new content every Wednesday. The first Wednesday of every month, I share with you skills in a blog post or article in the website. The second Wednesday, I share with you skills in a solo episode in the podcast. The third Wednesday, I share with you an interview with someone that has a specific expertise in acceptance and commitment skills applied to different areas like sports, organizational psychology, parenting, and many others. And the fourth Wednesday, I share with you curated resources that could be helpful to you. I started a newsletter in May 2020 with zero subscribers. Today, I am super happy to tell you that over 7,000 people receive the newsletter every Wednesday. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please go to the website www.thisisdrz.com. Now, let me tell you about today's episode. I am excited to share with you a very inspiring, interesting, and provoking conversation I had with Alex Hutchinson, PhD. Alex is an author and a journalist in Toronto. His primary focus these days is in the science of endurance and fitness, and he covers these topics for the Outside magazine. He is the contributing editor and writes a sweat science column. Alex is also a national magazine award winner and longtime columnist for the runner's world. He represented Canada internationally in track, cross-country, road racing, and mountain running competitions. And recently, he has published a fascinating book titled Endure, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. A couple of years ago, I was looking for a new book to read and I bumped into Alex's work. And as soon as I started reading the book, I told myself I have to talk to him. I have to interview him. And here is why. One of the ways in which we play it safe when dealing with anxieties, worries, and stress is by holding on to beliefs about who we are and what we're capable of without looking whether those beliefs work in our favor or backfire against us. It is as if every single thing that our mind tells us, we take it as the absolute truth. And when a person is participating in any type of athletic performance, they are going to experience physical discomfort. People are going to feel tired, exhausted, fatigued. 
And the question that has been really captivating for me is how do we manage those thoughts about those physical experiences? Imagine for a moment that you decide to go for a run. You're running and running and there you start feeling thirsty or you start feeling some pain in your legs or your knees are hurting. What does your mind tell you about those physical sensations? Do you continue running? Do you stop? What is the most effective way to deal with those physical sensations? What is the mindset that you need to have to perform at your best? So Alex's book taps into those topics, looking at how our physiology interacts with our psychology, looking at how our physiology interacts with our mindset, with our thoughts. In the conversation with Alex, you are going to hear us talking about different ways in which you can handle those thoughts about physical sensations in regard to athletic performance. And in the first part of the conversation, you're also going to hear a little bit about the behind the scenes of Alex's writing process. I have to tell you that I am so grateful that Alex made the time to chat with me. If you look at Alex's book, and I will highly, highly hope you do so. Again, the title of the book is Endure, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. In that book, you will see how Alex has done an incredible job compiling all the research out there not only on the physiological aspects of athletic performance, but also on the psychological aspects that can help a person to perform at his, her, or their best. This episode is longer than other episodes. In general, I try to keep the interviews to 25 to 30 minutes, but when I start chatting with Alex, I couldn't stop talking to him about this fascinating topic. I couldn't stop learning from him, hearing his process, and unpacking some of the ideas about what's the ideal mindset that a person needs to have to relate to physical experiences in athletic performance. So I encourage you to listen to this episode with a lot of openness and curiosity and see what works for you. Thank you so much for making the time. I appreciate the interest. Thank you. So when I was reading your book, Endure, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance, I was really, really impressed with how you compile a lot of information about athletic performance. I'm very curious about what's the mindset that could be helpful to improve athletic performance and how to handle physical aspects like pain, fatigue. And if we're going to use self-talk, we know it's not enough to be a cheerleader and say, just do it. I'm not, a, not an expert on everything, but I'm, you're welcome to ask me. And if I don't know the answer, I, 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 will, I will say that, or if I don't have an a, a, a expertise or whatever. Well, I think you're very humble. How long did it take you to write this book? How did you come up with the outline? Yeah, this was a pretty unique book for me. I, I, um, in that it, in some ways it took me like 10 years, um, not in the sense of 10 years of getting up every day at nine o'clock and, and writing, but I, uh, I, I work as a journalist. I'm a science journalist and my, my focus and my passion is endurance sports. And so between about 2009 and 2018, when the book came out, I was writing a, a, a regular, and I actually continue to write a regular blog called Sweat Science which uh, initially it was on my own blog and then it was for on the runner's world website for about five years. And now it's on the outside magazine website and several times a week, I find a new study, something that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I break down that study and write about what it means, maybe talk to some of the authors. And so I had once, let's say by about 2010 or so, I had this idea that I wanted to write about the brain's role in endurance. And so I was focusing my, my journalistic efforts on researching this area. And on and even when I did not just my blog, when I was doing magazine assignments, I was pitching assignments that took me, for example, to South Africa to visit a, a prominent researcher there named Tim Noakes. 
and write a magazine story about them. And so I was accumulating over the course of five or six years, a lot of, a lot of reading in, in the area, a, a lot of discussions and conferences that I went to and interviews that I did. And then I was writing the articles. And so when I sat down to try and pull together my book proposal and mm-hmm. the structure of the book, I had, I was in the fortunate position of already having done years of research in, in this area. And I can mm-hmm. contrast that to, to right now, I'm, I'm putting together a proposal for another book mm-hmm. on, in, an, in an area that I haven't spent a decade researching. And it's much harder because <laughs> I, I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of things that I want to write about, but as, to, to pursue them, I need to basically go do the research. And so it's hard to write the proposal without having done the, the research already. So anyway, that's, I, 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 I was fortunate because of my job to have spent a, a number of years talking to people and reading academic papers in this area. If I can ask a little bit more, because you could have focused in so many areas. You could have focused only in the physical aspects of endurance, but you chose this relationship between the mind and the body, specifically for the sport. So how did you decide that? What was interesting for you about it? Yeah, th- I mean, there's a couple of, of, of things there. W- one is I read a, a particular scientific paper back in maybe 2006 or so, no, 2007 or so, it was that, that particular paper was about thirst and it was posing the question, does thirst uh, have a negative effect on athletic performance? And that seemed like a really stupid question to me because of, of course it does. And the author, who was this guy, Tim Noakes, who, who, who uh, as a researcher in South Africa, made the case that actually much of what we attribute to thirst, you know, or what much of the many of the effects that we attribute to dehydration to mm-hmm. not having enough fluid in the body are actually the consequence of our brain monitor you know monitoring our fluid and believing that we might be in danger of running out of fluid and so there's mm-hmm. a mental state of being thirsty versus a physiological state of being dehydrated and this kind of blew my mind because mm-hmm. I'd never considered that that thirst could be at all controversial i read some more research by him and realized that this was one facet of a much larger discussion of when you hit your limits, to what extent is it because you're like a car and you're, you know, your wheel is falling off or, or you're out of gas? And to what extent is it more of a nuanced kind of your brain is, is, is deciding that you're approaching your limits? And so that was interesting to me scientifically. I didn't feel like it had been discussed in many of the books. I've, I had read many, many books about the, the sort of the science of running or of endurance, and I, that hadn't been discussed very much. And it also resonated with my own personal experience. I was a competitive distance runner with the Canadian national team. And I had had some very bizarre experiences, some of which I can count in the, can count, recount in the book of situations where I thought I was really fit and didn't run well, but and conversely other situations where I didn't think I was necessarily fit and ran better than I expected, thanks to things that affected my mindset. And so because I'd had that experience, and then I saw this research that I felt had been not really discussed very much, it, it sort of seemed like you know, by 2009 or 2010, I was like, this is a great book. I need to do it. It then took a long time, but it started with my own personal interest. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time when I ordered your book, I started reading the first chapter and I was like, oh my gosh, mainly because I can see how much you have compiled all the research that has been out there. It's a, it's beautifully put together in a storytelling format. So I had to pause because it literally blew my mind. The first chapter was like, oh my goodness. And then I took my time reading it. And I really appreciate what you're saying. You really did all the work out there. So I have a very logistical question about writing. Did you work with a team of fact checkers? Did you do all the checking yourself? And the other question here is, I don't know if it's a question or perhaps a comment that I absolutely love how you look at the research with critical eyes. You try certain procedures to see your experience. How was for you to write in the book that this particular research didn't work for me? Were you concerned about that? So I guess that's a two-part question. Yeah, so let me answer the second part. Um, the role that I've tried to play as a science journalist is as a, a sort of independent voice where I'm explicitly mm-hmm. not trying to advance my own theories. And this is, um, you know, this is a very, uh, it's a big problem in science 
is that people get attached to their theories, understandably. If you, if you spend your career, you have a great idea and you get some grants for it and you spend a decade or a couple of decades studying this idea, you will see the world through the lens of that idea being correct. And it's very hard to then honestly weigh the evidence that maybe you're wrong. And so I, I've really, really tried hard not to identify too strongly with the ideas I write about. And so to be willing to write about stuff that um, contradicts my assumptions and, to, and, and not to, even when I have, let's say there, there are differences of opinion, scientific opinion on a topic, I may have a sense that I think this option A is more likely to be right than option B. But mm -hmm. I try. I try not to. I try not to write it that way. I try to say I'm just going to tell you what the study says, and you, the reader, I've given you all the information that I have, mm -hmm. and the the way I've told it will probably tilt your your interpretation because it's that's just the way humans work. But I'm trying to not. I'm trying not to tell you what the answer is. I'm trying to show you what the evidence is. Mm -hmm. Now that that gets a lot harder because I've been writing in this same area for 10 years. I have opinions. I've stated opinions. So for something like dehydration, for example, which is hugely yeah. controversial, I've basically said, I don't think you need to drink as much as, as some experts say you do. And so now I, I'm aware that when I look at the literature and I see new studies, I tend to sort of ignore the studies that contradict the positions I've taken. And I think that's a, that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm sort of maybe sort of wandering from what, away from what your question was, but really i i try to present the evidence and and understand that it's complicated there will be conflicts and and that's okay that i can present an imperfect state of knowledge and it doesn't reflect on me it's not cuz cuz i'm not trying to be the guru who has the answer to everyone's problems i'm trying to present the evidence that various people have proposed for different approaches and that way if, if it's confusing or if it's yeah, if it's if it's contradictory it's not my fault I I, <laughs> I I i i never promised to give all the answers so that that's that's kind of my defense and perhaps that's the most scientific approach right um as we were talking at the beginning i was really impressed with the epilogue and the last chapter you really step back and with humbleness you say the research is mixed there are many things that we don't know Sometimes I think research can be presented in a way that is telling us the truth uh, and we don't question, but I think you did that. If I can ask a little bit more, how did you practice non-attachment to some of ideas or opinions you have? Because, you know, I know for me as a human being, once my mind holds into a theory, a hypothesis that makes sense, of course, our mind keeps going on with that. And it's hard to let it go. In science, as you say, many times people hold into their theories as their jewelry, right? Like, don't touch, don't mess up. And we get offended if someone questions that. How did you let it go that for you personally? Yeah, well, I mean, first thing I have to say is I don't think I've done it perfectly. And I know that I have, um, you know, I, I, ha I, I have become more attached to some theories than others. And if it's it's true also that if you look at, you know, if, I, if I'm really honestly self uh, you know, or analyzing this, this, I would say some of that depends on, you know, I, I interview people. Some people are nice to me. Some people are really rude. And it's like, <laughs> it's, it's very hard to, to, to then honestly assess the, the research when you're like, this guy's a real jerk. I, you know, and, 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 and so I, 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 again, I, of course I try not to let that affect me, but, but I'd be lying if I said that, that it's possible to be completely detached from the context and from your own feelings about what feels right. So again, like I said before, I have, I, I have experiences as a runner where some things, where there's a subjective experience of pushing mm -hmm. your limits. And there are some theories that, that seem to describe my subjective experience really well, but that's a terrible way of deciding whether something is true, that just that it, it sounds like what I experienced. That, all, all that means is that it's a good description. So anyway, yeah. the, best, the best answer I can give you is, is that, I, I at least try to be aware of these biases, and I, and and I, you know, I, I think the, and maybe this gets to to one of the themes of of something we'll talk about is that if if uh, my go my goal is to be impartial, like I was saying before, mm -hmm. not to not to be attached to given theories. If I was to hold myself to this ideal to say that therefore I am unattached and I am impartial, 
I'd have a lot of cognitive dissonance because that's not true. And I, and I, I, I know that I'm not perfect. And I'm, I, you know, it, it, as I've been saying it here over the last couple of minutes is that I have an, an ideal, but I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the fact that I'm not going to live up to that ideal, that all I can do is do my best to be aware of those sort of pitfalls of, of uh, wanting to be a guru, of wanting to have all the answers, of, of want, never wanting to admit that something I wrote two years ago might, might actually be wrong or that I, I missed something important. So I, I try, I accept that, and I accept that I'm not going to be perfect at doing that, that, that nobody is. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have so much respect for the position you're taking. And, and just for personal curiosity, where did you learn that mindset in which we're always questioning science? We're never done. We don't have the absolute truth. Literally, this is as far as we know. So in which part of your life history you develop that mindset of non-attachment to what we know? That's an interesting question. Well, one thing I would say is that I've definitely met lots of scientists who are who are willing to acknowledge the limits of their knowledge, and it's it can be very frustrating as a journalist when you're like, just summarize what you what you what what this study says. Well, it doesn't say anything. Like I can't possibly make any conclusions from my study. It's too preliminary. It's like I know, I know, I know. We don't know, but just just so anyway, there are there are people out there for sure. I love. Um, it. For me, you know, if I was really like delving into my own past, I would say or my own upbringing. One yeah. thing I've thought, I've th thought about a little bit is, uh, you know, my dad was a, I guess I would describe him as a, an ethicist. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. he, his, his, um, he, he taught at, in a, at the university of Toronto where I, where I live, um, uh, in the department of religious studies. Um, and his field or his specialty was trying to reconcile, um, how you have a public debate about, or how you have a debate among people who share, who have different fundamental beliefs. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's one thing if you're arguing with someone who comes from the same background as you about some important thing and you share the same fundamental assumptions about how society should work, but it's much different if you have a group of people. So for instance, he, he, he actually started out as a, as an oil field engineer and then mm -hmm. returned to school to study um, ethics and theology. And oh, wow. so one of one of his big case studies, one of, he wrote a book about this big debate in the, in northern Canada on mm -hmm. whether to build a pipeline through um, a remote area of the Canadian Arctic, which was land that was very important to the indigenous peoples there. So how do you have a debate between engineers and economists and um, uh, indigenous people who have completely opposing? Are not opposing, but just different views on what's important or what what we take for granted. Yeah. I think the whole way I was brought up, even just as a way of in terms of relating to other kids and stuff, mm -hmm. was to to have a respect for other people's perspectives and to always. I, I, to me, I think I grew up with the idea that if you're having a debate with someone and you feel like you truly can't understand why the person you're talking with is is taking the position you're taking, then the problem's with you because it, there's it's very rare that it's like that. Two, two reasonable people are having an argument and one of them is just a complete moron and, and doesn't have any justification for it. Instead, there's, there's usually some difference of perspective. And in order to have a productive conversation, you really need to be able to understand at least, even if you still disagree with them, it's not that you always disagree with the other person, but you should understand the, the way different perspectives can coexist. And so as a, as a science journalist, again, I'm comfortable with the fact that there are, uh, that, that, that there are different perspectives on problems and that for a, a lot of them, there's no easy, it, it's not like, oh, tomorrow there will be an experiment that will tell us once and for all that mm -hmm. this theory is right and that theory is wrong. For, in, in a lot of fields, conflicting theories will coexist for many, many years, uh, you know, decades, uh, because it's very hard to reconcile these things. And you have to be comfortable acknowledging that this guy in camp A has very strong feelings about the nature of reality. And this guy in camp B has also very strong feelings. They disagree with each other, but there may be elements in both of their perspectives that are, that are useful and correct. And when encountering that and holding that dialectics or that complexity of reality, right, which you handled so beautiful, did you have anyone getting upset with you because you wrote something on the book? Any reactions like that? You did a beautiful job in every single chapter, the chapter on pain, physical fatigue, looking some of the contradictions of the research. I, I, I did have some, some criticism after the book came out, um, or even before the book came out on some of my journalism. There was a, 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 a small a handful of researchers who feel that I didn't 
represent their their work accurately or uh, uh, give it sufficient credit. Mm -hmm. um, and my my and again, I've, I've you know I've obviously reflected on this, and and my feeling is they're they're mostly upset because I did give credit and time and expl and explanations to some of their rivals uh, mm -hmm. who, who they disagree with, who they feel. Uh, you know, are getting more credit than they deserve. Unfortunately, there's no referee that I, that I can say yeah. appeal to and say, "Look, here, here's what the here's what the literature says. Here are the interviews I did. Here's what people told me, and and here here's what I wrote. You decide w whether I did a fair job." I've I've tried to reach out to them online and and have some discussions. I think it's safe to say we'll 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 never be sort of guests at each other's Christmas party or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I I, I mean. It's actually just that one small group of a couple people who feel that way that I've that I've heard from. I'm sure you know what. Like the other thing, I guess as a more general point, what I will say is, because I'm a a journalist in a field and have been in the same field for more than a decade, I I, I cover repeatedly some topics, and sometimes I will write about. I'll see a study about some topic that is of interest, mm -hmm. and. I will hear again after that article comes out. I'll hear, I'll get an email from a researcher saying, "Oh, yeah, I saw your your article about this. You, you might be interested in this paper that 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 I did." And I'll look at it and I'll realize, "Huh, this is a paper from two years ago that makes basically all the same points as the paper that I just wrote." Mm -hmm. and, that, and that puts me in a sort of awkward spot because as a you know, I write for a publication. I can't pitch to my editor, "Hey, you know that article I did." Last week, how about I write another article that says exactly the same thing in order to, for me to be able to give credit to, to someone who was doing some research in the same topic? Mm -hmm. So I think that I, I imagine that when I'm getting, and, and these emails are almost always 100% polite. Nobody is like, very few people are having a tantrum and saying, hey, why did you ignore my paper? But I'm sure I know in their shoes, my feeling would be, oh, that's kind of too bad that I did this original thinking and now someone else has done a, a similar paper and they're getting the credit. And the truth is there's thousands of papers coming out every every month. And so it's impossible to sort of drink the entire fire hose and make sure you're always catching the first paper on a topic. So again, going back to acceptance of imperfection, I, I feel bad that I when that happens and I and I and I appreciate that the scientists usually are uh, are gracious about it. They're letting me know that they are doing research in that field. Mm -hmm. And and I'm feeling bad that I didn't see their original paper. And if I write about it again, I'll, I'll hopefully remember to give due credit uh, where it belongs. But it's it's definitely you know scientific credit is a, a difficult topic, not just for journalists but for scientists too. There's arguments about which papers are being cited by whom, and then who ends up getting credit in the public perception. And these are these are debates that have gone on for a long time. But it's it's definitely something I think about, and I you know I try to do my best, but it's it's. Uh, it is also a very difficult task to not to to make some mistakes on now and then. Definitely a very complex task, right? I think along those lines, given that you needed to submit that book and you have been studying this topic like 10 years for a while in many, many levels, when did you know that your book was done? Like I'm imagining, you know, you have all the data, you're reading the papers, and at some point there is always a possibility that what if there is another research? How how did you make that decision? Yeah, I mean, the, the harder part, to be honest, was to know when to start the book because right. by, by 2012, I was like, I have a ton of research, I should write a book. Right. But what will be in the book? Okay, let me start poking around and think. And and so there was it really took me probably three years of saying this month I'm going to write my book proposal before I finally, because I didn't have a deadline. It was just like, okay, I should write a book proposal. Okay. Um, and it was, and, and every month new studies were coming out and every month the, the contents of the book were getting more and more interesting because there, it, it was a very active area of research. It was it, the, um, in that decade, it was, that mm -hmm. was when this, this, this research that I wrote about, uh, I think really flourished. Um, so deciding that, the research gathering was finished and that I was going to write the proposal to the book was very hard. Mm -hmm. Now, writing the book itself, I then went to the publisher, got a, a book deal mm -hmm. uh, with a notional deadline. And mm -hmm. once I had a notional deadline, then it gets, it's no longer a question of what should I put in the book? It's what can I do before the deadline comes? And I did, I ended up extending the deadline by maybe th three months. I, from what I understand, that's sort of like, 
that's 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 on the low end of what authors usually do. So I kind of like, I said, I'm going to do it in 12 months. And the, and the publisher said, you're going to do it in 12 months. And we both knew that 15 months would be a more realistic time scale for that. So the one interesting, on that note, the one interesting wrinkle that happened is I was uh, a long way through the book. I can't remember. Ex- I would have been almost finished the book mm-hmm. when uh, let's say I was halfway or t- halfway through the book when I got an offer or an, or an opportunity to report on Nike's big breaking two yeah. project, the attempt to break a two hour marathon. And at mm-hmm. this point I had already locked in the structure of my book. I had written probably more than half of it. Wow. And I thought, wow, here is this real world thing where there's this huge corporate initiative to try to push back the limits of human performance. And here I am writing about the limits of human performance. What am I going to do here? So for, for, for those people who have not read the book, what the way, it, the way I ended up doing it was I had the structure of my book in, in three parts. Yes. And, and then I added, I basically told the story of the quest for a sub two hour marathon in four interludes before the first section, after the first section, after the second section, and after the third section. Um, and in the end, I like to think that that worked really well. And I've heard, I've heard from other people that they thought that that sort of the mixing of this story that progresses through the book with then that now we're going to take a ta- a, 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 some, some time to talk about the science of pain or whatever, and then we'll get back to this book. It worked fine, but that was a, a, a situation where I was like, uh-oh this amazing opportunity has come and I only have a couple months until my final draft is going to do. I can't rewrite the book. I can't redo the structure, but I was fortunately able to slot it in as a sort of uh, skeletal frame to the book. So it worked out fine. It would have been really challenging if that had come up just even a couple months later, I would have sort of had this dilemma of, of whether to include it in the book or whether to leave it out. And I don't think it would have been, even though that's those sections, they might be I don't know, a total of two or 3,000 words out of the 80,000 words, I think they play a really crucial role in grounding the topic that I'm writing about in the context of a real story. So I, I kind of got lucky on the timing there. Wow, that's fascinating. I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine right after you have written quite a while and then you get this offer. I can tell you what I love of the book, again, is not only you're talking about science, but there is your personal experience with every single piece of research. So I think the Nike story is really well embedded and adds so much more flavor to the book. Adds so much more flavor to the book. It's a unique story. Like it's, it's, I've, I've been a journalist now for, I don't know, 15, 17 years or something. There are very, very few stories where I've had such a, an opportunity to go really in depth on such a unique and rare I mean, things like that don't happen every year, uh, you know, big projects like that, that are sort of square in the middle of my own interests. So it was a, it, it would have been a very cool project, no, no matter what, like, even if it wasn't connected to a book but, that I was able to, to incorporate it, that in the book was a real s- stroke of good fortune. It's fascinating. Now, if I can ask a little bit more logistical questions about writing, because I think it's a fascinating process and I'm curious about yours. For this book, did you write every day? Um, how did you keep an outline? Yeah, so no, I definitely didn't write every day uh, very often um, for the reason that I was, uh, throughout this time, I was a freelance journalist also and, and you know, paying the rent. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and so I, throughout that time, let's see, I was writing for Runner's World. I was writing my Sweat Science blog I think it was uh, probably two to three times a week. I was writing articles about new scientific studies. I also had a newspaper column that was once every two weeks and a, a magazine column that was once every two months. Um, and so these things were non-negotiable. Like they, these are, these were, I mean, I, I could have quit the job obviously, but I was, these, these things were, were pre agreed, prearranged and, and in a perfect world, um, they would take about half my time, mm-hmm. uh, and the other half can be devoted to to the book. Um, in practice, yeah, they probably took about. Half. So the, the interesting thing is that after the book came out, um, and so I've been it's been three years now. Um, mm-hmm. I've been doing more or less the same 
ongoing things, but somehow they seem to take up all my time now that, now, now that I'm not <laughs> writing a book. So and I was like, how do I fit a, a book in there? But so I was, I was fitting it around other writing and I found it very, I find it very, very difficult. And I think this is a probably a common thing to switch gears. So it's hard for me to spend a morning writing a, 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 a newspaper column and then switch gears and then after lunch or, you know, at two o'clock say, all right, now I'm going to work on my book. Cause it takes me like an hour, or a couple hours to get back inside the book. Mm-hmm. And so I was the, the, the danger is that I was always trying to think like, Oh, I want to have some uninterrupted time for the book. So let me work ahead. I'm going to get this, you know, my, my sweat science column done. I'm going to get the next sweat science column. Done. I'm going to get my newspaper column done so that I can spend the rest of the week. But then things in, intervene, you know, during the writing of this book, I had my first kid and my second kid. Wow. Um, um, uh, things get busy. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, the week is over. And I'm only where I, I didn't do any book because by, by prioritizing the small discrete things that I thought I could check off my list, mm-hmm. I was always leaving and, and, and only wanting to work on the book when I had big chunks of time. It's very, it's much harder to find big chunks of time. Yeah, you bet. Um, I bet. So that, that was, um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, the the clarifying power of a deadline uh, mm-hmm. helped, and and I've finally started to to clear out some time, and my wife was very supportive. So I, I had lots of family support. My parents were contributing childcare and things like that. Mm-hmm. In terms of the logistics of writing, I used uh, a program called Scrivener, mm-hmm. which is it's sort of like, it's it's not all that different from like Microsoft Word, except that it allows you to have. Um, it makes it easy to have lots of different sub chunks of mm-hmm. book open and you can have both the te- you can you have a section of like the text for each section of of your your book and then the notes or research or ideas that are linked together so you can see the sort of structural notes you had and then you can see what you're writing and it's very easy to move chunks around you don't want so when when i when i'm using word I'll, what i'll off for a big magazine piece for example mm-hmm. i'll have you know nine different word documents that I need to have open at the same time. Cause I'll have, I have a, not, I mean, if you want look at it, let's, I'll, I'll give you my, 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 my writing structure. Off to. Um, which is, let's say I'm writing a magazine piece. I'll, I'll have a sort of four part flow from, I, I start with a, I'll have a word document and essentially word of like notes for the piece. So just like okay. links to ideas, scattered thoughts, uh, people I want to interview, Mm -hmm. um, just everything I can think of is going to be in that document so that eventually when I write it, I'm going to go back to that document and make sure that there aren't any notes that I was missing. And and from there, I'll move from this just completely freeform, long list of of notes and ideas and thoughts and people and places. I'll move to what I call the elements, which Mm -hmm. is okay. From all these notes, what are the important parts that I really want to get in there? What are the, and elements might be scenes, they might be themes, they might be people. And so I need to get this person in. I definitely have to have this scene that I reported. I definitely need to have, so, so it's not just the rough notes. It's like, these are the blocks of the story. And then from the elements, I'll move to the outline where I'm like, now I'm going to take these blocks that I put in the elements and I'm going to put them in order. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to decide how, and this is the, really maybe the, the key part is this is figuring out the structure. So saying, this is how I'm going to open. This is where I'm going to explain what the story is about. And this is the, the order in which I'm going to bring these pieces in. And then from there, once I have that, writing the draft feels much less onerous because I'm not just staring at a blank screen. I'm, I just know, oh, I have to write this block and it has to lead me to the next block. And I know what the next block is, I write that block and, I, and it's going to lead me to the next block. So I have those, those sort of going from just unstructured notes to elements, each of which are important to a outline, which is in order, mm-hmm. uh, but not, but not writing prose and then to the draft. Got it. Uh, and when I'm writing the draft, if I'm having, if I'm having trouble, if I'm, if it's going slowly, I stop capitalizing words. Cause you know, when I, you're writing, I often get hung up trying to get to have the perfect sentence. And so if I say to myself, I can't think of what the perfect sentence is going to be is right now, yeah. but I know roughly what it's going to say. So I'm just going to write this sentence down without any capital letters so that I know it's not going to accidentally get included in my final draft. And then okay. I find I can write it about five times the speed when I, when I stop capitalizing. And then later I'll go back and turn that, that uncapitalized stuff into capital, into the, the final product. And mm-hmm. 
often I find that I don't have to make many changes because once you've unblocked and stopped fretting about the perfect word, you, it just comes out fine anyway. But it, it, that's something that for me, in terms of my personal, um, you know, factors that slow me down, I find if I, if I stop capitalizing, that allows me to sort of stop worrying about things. Got it. But sometimes people get very attached to the outline. Once they have the outline, it's like, this is it. How is for you? I'm like that. I, I, I don't recommend it. I don't, I don't suggest that this is a good thing, but, but it's, um, I find it very hard to, to be like, oh, well, you know, I, I mean, sometimes you recognize like this just isn't working. This is not the flow. I need to get to this. Uh, often when I'm writing up the draft, I'll, I'll, I'll realize that one section wants to end. It, or there's a natural way of ending one section that leads to a different section, which is not the section I hand planned next. So you can shuffle those blocks around a little bit, but in general, I, I actually, that's one of the reasons I try to be very careful and methodical in constructing my, my outline is Mm -hmm. that I, I know that I'm predisposed not to change it, that for more or less, once I, once I write it, uh, it's unlikely to change. So if, if I get it wrong, if I have it, uh, the bad outline, it's going to really slow me down because it's going to take me a long time to realize that the outline's not working. Got it. Yeah, it's great to be mentally flexible. You know, there's a big debate. I remember when I was in journalism school, one of the things they talked about was like the two schools of writer, one one of whom spends 50% of the time on their first sentence, which is <laughs> kind of me, and they, they want to get it right. They can't write anything. And I think that there's a quote from, I don't know if it's Susan Orlean or something, that once you've written the first sentence, everything else is, you know, is inevitable. You've, you've set the tone for the piece. And the other of whom is like, forget the first sentence, just write your piece and worry about your first sentence afterwards. And I can't do that. I'm definitely a, I kind of, I really fret over getting the opening right, because I think that's really important. And I seldom go back and change it dramatically. Sometimes I do sometimes, you know, obviously sometimes you realize that actually this opening isn't working, but uh, I I tend to try and get my, I get my outline nailed down and then I write it. And as I go, I, I seldom go back and make huge changes, which isn't, yeah, again, is not like, this isn't advice. It's just a sort of, a, this is the reality of how I tend to, to approach things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love to get the behind the scenes of how you come up with a book. And um, I was super curious about the writing process. So thank you so much. If it's okay, let me switch gears because I have other questions about the mindset that could be helpful to improve athletic performance. The book is structured in three parts, mind and muscle, limits, and the limit breakers. And all of them are fascinating. Learning about the complexity of science was super cool. Um, I think there is a whole industry in the 90s that was built around positive thinking and positive thoughts. And somehow in the sports industry that has translated as tell yourself you can do it, which I'm a renegade against. I don't think there is anything wrong with thinking positive, but the context in which we do it, I think it's very important. Many times positive thinking can be used as a form of thought suppression, right? Like if I'm walking in the streets and I have the thought that what if I don't make it in this job interview? Or what if I don't do a good job when I'm talking to Alex? Positive thinking will be like replacing my mind with something positive uh, and telling myself all the good qualities I have. So that research has been very clear in the impact of that suppression. We know that the body feels tired. We know that we experience fatigue. We know that we get thirsty. But we also know that the mind is going to come up with some thoughts about how to handle those physical experiences. I am curious, in this book, you basically dig a lot into three, three variables or three ways of looking at our mind self-talk, brain endurance training, and electric brain stimulation. I am curious, what, what would you say are the key points that are important for any um, professional athlete that needs to keep in mind? So given the research you have done, how would you respond to that question today? Yeah, so that's a big, big a question. question. <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me start with some general thoughts and see, see okay. where we go from there. I agree with you that you can't just you know, if or that it's not productive if you're feeling bad to just say I feel good, right? Like that's 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 not useful. That's and it's not realistic. <laughs> if we feel bad, we know we're feeling bad. It's true. One thing that I think is worth maybe distinguishing is 
the difference between feeling not very good and having thoughts that are not true mm-hmm. or that are that are demonstrably you know that that let's say if you're thinking everybody else is way faster than me mm-hmm. and there's nobody there's no nobody else is feeling how i'm feeling i feeling terrible um everyone else around me this is so easy for them yeah now that's a perception about the world that frankly is 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 not correct and you know in, in most situations everyone else is feeling the same way and it can have negative repercussions if, if your thought is then if the train of thought is then therefore i should drop out at this next aid, aid station and i should take the bus back to the start line accepting that thought in a competitive sport context is not it's, it's not going to get you the finish line right. and 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 what's what's interesting to me and and it's it it's interesting I, you know i just i still i i don't compete you know internationally anymore but i i still train and i run races and i actually ran my first race in uh uh in a couple of years since the start of the pandemic uh, a, a couple of weeks ago and it was interesting to get back into that zone and to remember the thing that struck me is that there is in the context of competition mm-hmm. um which is probably true in the context of a lot of of a lot of sort of high stakes situations, not just athletic, but certainly in the context of a race of a, let's say a 10 K race or something like that. Mm-hmm. You enter a zone of wild cognitive distortion. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it, you can't reproduce it outside of that zone. And, and it's always remarkable to me. Like I'm, I'm really, I'm quite good at math. It's, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a strength. I did a PhD in physics. I'm good at math. Mm-hmm. And yet uh, a, a situation that happens to me quite frequently is, you know, I'll be, I, I would be running a race, a track race where every 400 meters, someone is telling me my splits. They're saying that was 67 seconds for that lap. Okay. 68 seconds for that lap. Mm-hmm. And halfway through the race, I would realize, oh, I can't believe this is a race is a disaster. I have failed again. I'm on, I'm not on pace to set yeah. my personal base best. In fact, I'm on pace to set to, to run one of my worst races ever. This is a humiliation. Mm -hmm. Um, There's no point. You you know what, in order to save face, I should stop trying. I should just sort of make it look like I don't care anymore. And then that has happened even on races that have ended up being some of my best races. Um, I've sort of struggled through them. And then with maybe a kilometer or two to go, I've suddenly realized, oh my God, I can still set my best time if I really speed up now. And it makes Mm -hmm. no sense. And I'll realize afterwards, it's like, I was somehow doing the math wrong in the middle of the race. Mm-hmm. I was, I was distorting, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that I was saying two plus two is five, uh, but I was, I was projecting and saying, I'm a few seconds off my pace. Therefore, there's no way I can set my personal best time. I've, I've, I've failed this race. And so in a lot of cases, I think when we talk about self-talk, um, there's the, there are these responses that happen under stress to cues that are repeated every time we, we, not every time, but frequently, you know, every time you race or many times when you race, you're going to encounter a lot of familiar scenarios Mm -hmm. and we have familiar trains of thought that are overwhelmingly designed to say, you know what, why are you punishing yourself like this? Just, just, you know, it's not, you're not going to win, stop. And so you, it's not so much about saying, I feel great. It's about saying, this, this is what it's supposed to feel like this. And this is normal. I expect this. And I, and I'm, and I, I'm going to keep pushing that, that, that this is, this is what I'm here for. And there is no, there is no, no matter what the, 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 the feedback is right now, I, I want to, and, or whatever, you know, everyone is, every, like, there are different scenarios and there's also very, di- one thing that I didn't really appreciate when I wrote the book and I have mm-hmm. appreciated a little more since um, I gave a talk to, to um, professional baseball players here in Toronto mm-hmm. And one of the sports psychologists who works with them afterwards was like, yeah, you know, that's an interesting talk, but you know, like motivational self-talk, which is the subset that is relevant to endurance is not all that relevant to baseball players. Convincing yourself that you feel great is not necessarily what, what you, what you need if you're trying to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball there, they, they tend to focus on procedural self-talk on st- getting a, uh, you know, focusing on the, the movement of the body or certain cues 
it's not about psyching yourself up or feeling great. It's about getting in the right zone. So the, there are very different contexts for self-talk. The, the, the big thing I would say is, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's not, self-talk isn't necessarily about, or at least as I understand the current incarnation of self-talk, yeah. it, it's not just about getting the pom-poms out and, and saying, you're, 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 you're doing great. You're wonderful. And, and it, it definitely has to include an ability to accept negative thoughts, to, 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 to accept discomfort. Yeah, yeah. So I think the way that we understand self-talk certainly has changed these days. I think in the past, it was more these chief leader statements. And I love what you are distinguishing, that we have to look at certain thoughts in the context in which they are happening. Me trying to run for fun, a very different context of participating in a marathon, two different settings. Um, If we can go back to this, I think one of the things I hear is that the acceptance of our internal experiences actually can um, be extremely powerful for us to keep going physically. And, you know, within acceptance and commitment training, that's a huge process making room for all the yucky stuff that comes when you're doing what matters. For example, yesterday I was going for a bike ride. I'm trying to train myself to go up a hill and it's really hard. And I start hyperventilating. My heart is beating fast. And my mind is telling me like, you can't do this. Just pause, go back. But telling myself, I'm, my breathing is heavy right now. I'm just noticing this shortness of breath. It doesn't keep me into this struggle in my head. How do you make sense of that in terms of the acceptance in the research you have done? Yeah, I mean, so I often make the the sort of comparison of, let's say you have someone who has not trained before and decides to run a 5K. And so they get up off the couch and they start, they start by running one minute and then walking for a minute or whatever. and, And six months later, they run a 5K. Mm-hmm. A lot has changed in those six months. Their their heart is stronger. Their their muscles are stronger, et cetera, et cetera. We we understand all these physical changes, but people often don't appreciate the mental changes that have happened. Um, and and one of the key ones is this changing relationship with discomfort. That yeah. and and when you, if you're new to running and you go mm-hmm. and you start running and you feel you you get short of breath, which is a very panic inducing phenomenon, and your legs start to hurt. You interpret this with fear. You interpret this, this means something is wrong and I need to stop. I can't breathe. I'm going to pass out if I don't slow down. Once you've been running for a while, you understand it, you bit by bit, you, you realize, okay, I had that sensation of breathlessness for 30 seconds yesterday and I kept running and it was okay. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the next week, 45 seconds, you do it and you realize that eventually you, you start to distinguish between, um, it, the actual feeling or the actual phenomenon of your breathlessness and your fear of what it means. Mm-hmm. And, and the fear starts to dissipate because you realize actually being breathless, you know, you, 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 there is almost nobody on the planet who can run themselves unconscious. They, you, you can't, you will get tired, you, but you won't, you won't be able to just keep running until you actually pa- pass out from lack of oxygen. So then it's, it, it changes from a panic signal to just, mm-hmm. This is just information about how hard I'm working. The harder I'm breathing, the harder I'm going. And, and, and that signals that I can't keep doing this indefinitely. But the feeling itself is nothing to be afraid of. And so yeah. you, you start to, that feeling becomes something you accept. And, and at a certain point, for a lot of people, it becomes something you seek out because you know that this is, you're trying to get fitter. You're trying to improve yourself. You know that if you're training and you, you're feeling this discomfort and this breathlessness and this, this sort of lead feeling in your legs, this is precisely what you set out to do. You're having a good workout and you're getting better. And so you've completely changed your relationship with this negative sensation that filled you with fear when you, when you started out. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that th- this is a microcosm of, of, of how people learn to, to reframe their thoughts organically Yes. But some people do it better than others, and some people can benefit from specifically thinking about, okay, what, what, what am I thinking? What, what is, what is it that's causing me, uh, you know, discomfort or fear or, or, or whatever when I'm when I'm in this situation? I think one of the things that I encounter in my work is that once we have experiential knowledge, that shifts our beliefs. 
like it happens organically, exactly as you're saying. But I think the challenge, what I have here sometimes, um, let's say that you're playing tennis uh, and you are afraid like, oh my gosh, I'm not hitting well, then they are going to kick me out of the team. I'm going to lose. So what do you think, based on the research you have done, what will be uh, an effective and workable way of handling those thoughts? What will be the self-talk there that may be more effective, in your opinion? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. I actually wrote about a study where they they evaluated the self-talk of marathoners and badminton players, and then used machine learning to sort through all these statements to see if they could distinguish wow. between a marathoner and a badminton player. And they could, because there's two very different uh, f- focuses. Both of them were overwhelmingly negative. Interestingly, they, both marathoners and badminton players are very hard on themselves. And they're thinking, uh, I just don't have it today. I, I, you know, my game is terrible. I'm not, or I'm running ter- terribly. And we could debate and discuss whether that's, whether that's a problem or whether they should be more positive, but for the, for the tennis player there, I mean, there, this gets into, I mean, there's, there's a, a, I want to be careful (laughs) claiming that I know what uh, to say, because there's a a really big literature on um, skill oriented things like tennis, where if you're, for instance, focusing internally versus externally, Mm -hmm. are you focused on, uh, you know, what you're, what you're doing to the ball, or are you focused on what your arm is doing to make the ball do something? And so and there's also a, a, a another body of literature on um, novices versus experts. So if you're an expert in a domain, then the best thing you can do is let your autopilot take care of that task because you've you've optimized that. And so if you try to, I mean, the essence of choking is taking a skill that you know well and trying to break down. It's like if I and this, you know, I have young kids, so uh, mm-hmm. the best example for me is teaching someone to tie your shoes. Uh, mm-hmm. tie the shoes. I know how to tie my shoes. I tie them very easily with no effort. But if you break it down and say, what are the seven steps to tying your shoe? It's like, oh, wait, now, what do I do first? Do I go over or under? Or then does it go around? Or do I, which loop do I make the hand with? I actually don't know the steps to tying mm-hmm. my shoe. So if I force myself to, to over-focus on the technical process, I yep. become less fluent in that process. So for mm-hmm. tennis players, there's a whole bunch of considerations about what what is the right thing to do, but focusing on your yourself and focusing on your fears and, and the consequences of those fears isn't productive. I don't think would be productive. So I guess maybe what I would assume is that if you're able to just say, yes, I'm feeling that I'm, I'm feeling, I, I'm feeling worried about, how I'm playing and what the consequences may be Mm -hmm. without fighting it, but just, just acknowledge it, let it go and then move on. That seems like the best approach to me, as opposed to saying, you know, no, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. uh, I'm strong enough. The coach knows that I'm a good player. So even if I have a bad game today, um, he's not going to kick me off the team. I think I agree with what I think you're saying, which is that that's not having that debate with yourself in the middle of battle, I don't, I don't think is useful. What, maybe there's some role for outside of the context of the competition, mm-hmm. thinking about why you're having those thoughts and trying to interrogate those thoughts and, and, and thinking about other things you could be thinking about. But yeah, I, I don't think you can fight that battle in, in the middle of your tennis game. Yeah, yeah. I think in general, I don't know if you, you agree with this, but what we have learned so far, at least, you know, again, all this within the research of behavioral science is that in a given moment, going into these mental bubbles, trying to prove our thoughts wrong, trying to find the evidence for or against, and in a high stake situation actually creates so much mental noise that keeps me stuck in my head while that situation is happening outside, or it drives more avoidant behavior. So, and and I think for what I read, again, my, my understanding is that something you have witnessed to some degree, that there is the acceptance of these thoughts can be much more um, empowering for people. Um, would you agree with that? Is that a fair conclusion here? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on both points that first of all, that you can't, you can't fight it. So even if, even if it would be beneficial to, to win that argument with yourself, it's not, you, you can't, you're not, you, you, you're just going to be stuck in your head arguing with yourself. So in, in terms of the self-talk context, what's yeah. the most useful, when you have that thought, what's the most useful thing to say to yourself? It's, it's like, yes, that's how I'm feeling. Remember to pivot to my right for the forehand and make sure to get topspin or, or this, this opponent is it, it, uh, d- not, doesn't handle it well when I get it, my shot deep or whatever. And they have to focus on the process on the outside. Don't, don't, don't even agree to have that argument and just, yeah, that's how I feel. That's fine. This is part of tennis. That's right. Like I'm feeling X, I'm sensing X or I'm afraid of this. And the other aspect, if it's okay, in terms of motivational self-talk, I love what you mentioned moments ago that when you were giving this talk to, I think, baseball players, there was this comment about focusing on the procedure. So we know that sometimes people tend to, <laughs> tend to visualize their future self, their future life. The challenge is that what we have seen in behavioral science, again, is that it's actually counterproductive for people to have the visualization of the outcome because you don't have control of the outcome. But however, visualizing the steps that you need to do is much more effective. If you want to take a trip to Hawaii, imagine you're sitting in front of that computer trying to book for your tickets. So visualizing that procedure that you need to take for a certain outcome, much more effective. How do you see that in, in the context of what you have established? Yeah. You know, there's, it, it makes me think of an interesting book that I read. I think it came out uh, this spring called The Genius of Athletes, um, which is by a sports psychologist and a, and a, a colleague of mine, a sports science journalist, uh, Noel Brick and Scott Douglas. And they sort of try and look at the various psychological approaches athletes use in different contexts. And one of the stories they tell is of Michael Phelps, the swimmer, um, of his visualization that he was not in the school of like, let's visualize myself standing on the podium with my 150th Olympic medal or whatever. He was, um, he would visualize things that could go wrong and how he would handle them. What would happen if this happened? And so one of the things he visualized was, you know, what happens if my goggles come off? Uh, can I swim this race blind? And then that happened at the, at, at the Olympics, his, his goggles came loose on the dive. And so he had to be able to swim and make the perfect turn and the touch at the end without, without being able to see where the wall was. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but he had visualized it so many times that first of all, he was able to, to, to right. swim as he expected, but also he didn't panic because he, he had, he had been through this negative situation before. Mm-hmm. Um, so he hadn't just visualized uh, you know, massive success. He'd visualized the process, the various things he might have to do to get there. Um, mm-hmm. So I thought that I thought that was an interesting example of that. Fascinating. How, how do you see that? Because sometimes one of the things that happens for people who are more prone to worry, they are going to think about all the what if, you know, what if I lose this? What if I don't get this? Uh, so how will we handle that? In the work I do, we try to distinguish what is a productive worry versus unproductive worry. Because the mind will come with hundreds of what-if thoughts. Now, sometimes people will try to prepare for all these what-if thoughts, which in some way, this is what uh, Michael Phelps did. But it didn't work for him. It was effective. What is your take on that? I think that, and, and this is the, the sort of general, a, a general truth that I would say about all these discussions is that they're, they're so dependent on the individual. And so I know like in, in the, in yeah. the sports psychology world, there's a sort of outmoded now, I don't think people talk about this anymore, but there was the arousal curve mm-hmm. um, where, you know, you have to get psyched up enough to perform at your best. But if you get too psyched up, you, you go back on the down on the other side of the curve. And, and so the, when, if you're asking like, how, how should one get psyched up for a race? Well, it's like, well, it depends where you are on that arousal curve and what the shape of your arousal curve is, because for some, some people go into races and they're not psyched up enough. And some people are, don't. so in this sort of positive and negative or fear and worry thing, I think that's also true. So I think Michael Phelps's approach, I don't think would be optimal for me. I was a very nervous uh, racer. I, I did not need any additional help to think about things that could go wrong. Um, I, you know, I, I had that covered. So if anything, I needed to be wor- thinking about, um, not about things that could go right. I needed to be thinking about 
what mattered and 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 that things would be fine that, that in essence that the, the the process was was what was important and whatever would happen would happen and that i had done mm-hmm. my best that that the way i the way i was most able to get at peace with myself before a race was to remind myself that i'm just going to go out and do as the best i can and it doesn't it you know like i can't control the outcome so why yeah. worry about it and it, for me i was so nervous before races in a lot of cases that thinking about well, what if my pants fell down or, you know, whatever, that would just be a disaster. I, d- I didn't need any, but mm-hmm. Phelps had already won, you know, a dozen Olympic gold medals or whatever. He probably had so much confidence and well-justified confidence that it might've been useful for him to think about the ways that things might not go perfectly. It's fascinating what you're saying. I think you have found that acceptance of the uncertainty of whatever happens that was helpful to you. In the past, some of the studies have shown that when people cognitively rehearse what could possibly go go wrong, they are training themselves to cope with that situation. But like you, I don't think one size of thinking about this helps everyone. It's so individualistic. It really can backfire for another person to go into these all these what-if scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, yeah. You need to look at the individual and say, what are the, what are the challenges you face in, yeah. in your sport and based on your personality based, you know, so I, I really struggled with this in, in going back to the book I, I, I wrote, one of the criticisms I, 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 or one of the pieces of feedback, let's say I got was, oh, you wrote about all these things that might affect performance, but you didn't tell us how to fix them. And, and that's because ultimately anything I say how could it apply to everyone, right? Like, okay, something, you know, you take drugs, maybe that'll make you faster. But in terms of the psychological stuff, I really felt uncomfortable in trying to generalize into like, here's the three-step process that will, um, that will work for for everyone. Um, Because, yeah, I mean, again, to to, to, to one of the points you made right at the beginning, this idea of like, uh, positive thinking, which is how many people think of uh, motivational self-talk. I often had feedback at, you know, I'd give a talk or something and someone would come after me, come up to me after and say, it's interesting, you know, you talk about thinking positively and stuff and, and, but all of my best races have been when I'm angry, you know, when, when I'm, in, I'm mad about something, I feel like I've got a chip on my shoulder. And it's like, yeah, actually, and you know, there is research too, but people have done studies of, you know, how long can you hold a weight up after you've told a story about a time when some, something made you really mad versus when you've told a story about something, when something made you happy or whatever, or, or confident, there, there is something to this sort of superpower of anger, mm-hmm. but it's, it's context dependent. It's person dependent. It's, you know, so it's, um, I, I, I would really shy away from claiming that, that certainly that I know, um, you know, the three steps that everyone should take before running a marathon or whatever. There's some general ideas out there, but, but really like it ultimately, if you can work either, you know, on your own or with someone to, to figure out what is it that for you that, that is helpful or unhelpful. And then how can you, how can you address those things? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think again, for me, your last chapter was very, very moving. I think you mentioned that you are talking about a book and there is a woman that approaches you and she said, you don't believe it. And it looks like that question really got you thinking a lot. Do you mind sharing a little bit that moment? Yeah, yeah. This was, a, I, you know, I guess in the, in the months after the book came out, I, I was giving a talk somewhere and, um, and, and a, a woman put her hand up and, and asked about the last line of the book which is something along the lines of, you know, the, in terms of pushing back the limits of performance, I say something like there's more in there if you can believe it. That, yes. And, and, and that, that, that last chapter is called belief. And my, my, uh, my, my sort of my, my conscious intention with that last line was to say that belief, self-belief or belief in, in your capacity has an impact on performance. So you, if you can believe what you're in, in your ability to do something, that's going to help you push back your limits. But mm-hmm. the way she interpreted it was you've written about all this, you know, psychology research, but you don't really believe it. You, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you can believe it. And, and I, you know, I thought, I thought about it and I was like, I think she's right. I think, I think, I think she's, uh, I, it's not that I don't believe it at all, but that I, it's a, it's a, it's a hard fit for me. My interest started as with physiology. Mm-hmm. And, and I was very skeptical of the psychology 
even of the sports psychologists that we had when I, you know, on the track team I was on in the nineties, I just didn't, didn't make sense to me that it could matter. And so it's been a long road um, for me to sort of, to, to come to the conclusion that, yeah, I think it does matter what's going on in your head. I think that does influence what you perceive as your, the limits of your performance, whether they're physical or, you know, in a more general context. Um, it's still another step from there to say, therefore, here's what you should do. So I guess I'm, I, I would describe myself as, as still on that sort of journey of trying to figure out what I do believe and, and, and what we can do with that in a practical sense. It's a beautiful story. Again, for me, it was, it's very moving to, to experience your humbleness with this topic. Um, may, and maybe because I'm very annoying right now, maybe we can agree that acceptance is the main problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's an important one. It's a, it's a, it's a precondition. If look, it, I can speak from the perspective of endurance sports, of endurance running. Mm-hmm. If, if you can't accept discomfort, your career is over your career, because, it, and I, I talk about this in a little bit in the chapter on pain. Some so mm-hmm. a, a, a scientist in Germany said something along the lines, but you know, look, if you're a great soccer player, if you're a Maradona, you can believe that it's possible to be a beautiful artist on the, on the pitch and uh, without suffering. Um, mm-hmm. But you can't, if you're a marathoner, you cannot believe that there is any, uh, anything you can do that doesn't involve suffering. That's mm-hmm. the, the, the nature of endurance sports. So step one to pushing your limits is to accept that it is going to hurt. Nobody on the start line of a marathon who's trying to run fast is under the, can be under the delusion that it's not going to hurt. So acceptance is stage is, is really important. Um, what you do with that acceptance then gets is interesting and, and how much you're willing to accept and, and how you handle it at mile 20 or mile 22, when things really start to get unpleasant. But, but yeah, I think, I think for endurance athletes, they would, they would certainly, I don't, they would have to see the truth in what you're saying that, that you can't just, you can't tell yourself it doesn't hurt. You can't argue with yourself. You can't reframe that as a, oh, it's actually a positive thing. I'm actually, you know, it's, it's, it's the evil in my soul dying. That's what I'm feeling. No, no, there's no positive. It's going to hurt. And that is a, an, an essential thing to accept. So yeah, I, 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 I will agree with you on that. I love that. <laughs> And because we're running out of time, and, and again, I am so grateful to have a chance to chat with you about this. The whole conversation has been very moving for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Here's my last question. If you were to have a cup of coffee or tea or a beer or scotch with someone, with any person you want, who would that be for you today? Hmm, a living person. I assume. It can be a living person or someone that passed away, either way. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question because there's lots of possible answers. I write in the book about Elliot Kipchoge, mm-hmm. um, who, who is the world record holder for the marathon from Kenya and who yeah. has acquired a sort of reputation as a sort of uh, a deep thinker about the, the nature of, of limits. I've interviewed him. I've seen him but it's always been in the context of formal media availabilities, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, shepherded by his sponsor, Nike and stuff. You you don't really have a true conversation with someone in, in those, in that context. Um, So if I could have a cup of very sweet tea with Elliot Kipchoge in a context in which he was at his ease and off guard and not, Maybe I don't have a notebook with me or anything, and I could just uh, try to understand a little bit more about his his relationship with the sport, with with running, and what he thinks about. I I, I would love that. It's a very for, he's now famous enough that such conversations probably very rarely happen for anyone. It's but better. so this is, if we're if we're if we're having fantasy conversations, it would be an unscripted and non media specific cup of tea with Elliot Kipchoge. You know. Um... I hope that conversation happens and I hope it's not a fantasy conversation. (laughs) Thank you so much again. I'm very appreciative. I hope I can chat with you again in a couple of months. Sure. I I really enjoyed the conversation and thanks for for the interest in the the topic of the book and also the process of writing. It's, It's really fun to have a chance to discuss that. Thank you.
Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, I will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. And if you're feeling extra generous, I welcome a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes of this episode are in the website playingitsafe.com. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable playing it safe actions. See you soon.